术中呢，我们可以呃通过超声速冻监测评估我们手术治疗的效果。术后对于我们手术的效果以及手术中是否有存在一些并发症，以及是否需要再次手术，有非常重要的意义，是对我们心脏外科呃手术效果的一个裁判。那么我们术前会给他一个非常精确的诊断，那么这个的话。Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, how are you? We can hear you, Doc. Go ahead. And I think um, I can welcome everybody back uh, to our third session. I think the morning session and the topics were they were quite uh, current and very stimulating and the time went by so quickly. And um, um, the third session equally uh, will be, we hope will be captivating and we will be discussing sexual and reproductive health care. Hello. Okay, so um, I was hoping the video would stop, but I see it's not stopping. I will continue anyway and hope that you can hear me, Veronica. Hi, uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, that okay. video is Dr. Uh, Dr. Marilis video that she wants me to play when she starts. Okay. So for those who have not met Dr. Marera, I'll quickly introduce her. She's um, a specialist obstetrician and gynecologist uh, and is practicing at Seagrave uh, Women's Medical Clinic. And she was born and bred in Zimbabwe. She's a lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe Medical School. Uh, she holds a bachelor's and um, master's degrees from the University of Zimbabwe and uh, as well as a fellowship in obstetrics for, uh, with the College of uh, South Africa. She's also on the scientific committee of the Zimbabwe Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and she's a founding and committee member of the Zimbabwe Society of Gynecological Endoscopy, uh, which is the minimal access surgery. And she has a special interest in um, practicing laser therapy in gynecology. And uh, she, will, she will be our first speaker for this uh, third afternoon se session. And she will be introducing FemiLift. So Dr. Marere, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Ziki, for the kind introduction. Honestly, today, I don't think we should even be presenting. It's really been so powerful and so empowering. We've enjoyed ourselves, but um, now um, I'm introducing a subject which is uh, really not a life and death matter as the ones that we've been discussing since uh, morning. Uh, so you can sit back, relax a little bit and um, 
just listen to what I have to say about um, laser therapy in gynecology. Um, this is something that I just decided to take on as a hobby as I was getting a bit tired of asking women to bear down. And then I decided, what else can I do? And I just discovered something interesting um, that we can offer women um, uh, laser. So I'm just going to start with you off with uh, this video that's just going to be about two minutes and then we'll get into it. Um, Veronica, can you please um, play that video for me? Thanks. Welcome to the volume. All right, thank you, Veronica, um, for that. I'm not sure if the, the sound was on, but anyway, we'll go through that as we go along. So I'm, going to I'm going to start sharing my screen now.
Hello, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. We can see Dr. Marilyn. Okay, thank you. All right. So basically, I'm just going to go through. Um, oh no. All right, I'm just basically going to go through an, a background or introduction to the topic, and then I'll describe what Family Lift is, how it works, um, what range of treatments we can get from Family Lift, and how we wake up for, uh, our patients for treatment. Um, I'll provide a bit of evidence on um, just to say that laser works, and lastly, we'll talk a bit about what we've just done at the clinic with laser this year. So, as an introduction, we know that with time, natural processes in women, basically like childbirth, the menopause um, uh, and different physiological changes will give rise to various health problems in women. So women will complain sometimes of involuntary urine leakage. They'll have vaginal laxity, they'll have vaginal dryness. Um, they will complain of recurrent infections. And all of these unfortunately can have negative, um, a negative impact on the quality of life of women, especially when you think of stress urinary incontinence, the involuntary urine leakage there, uh, making them less self-confident. So sometimes these uh, problems are just swept under the carpet or sometimes women don't think they are important enough to bring up. And you'll find when they come for the consultation, sometimes they don't allude to these issues earlier on. They would rather talk about um, the obvious things that have got heavy bleeding, but they will not really say that, um, I think I've got um, um, stress urinary incontinence or I've got vaginal laxity, for example. But with time, you'll find that these things affect women's um, mental well-being physical well-being and even social well-being and sexual well-being as well. And sometimes it's, it's, it's quite important that women can even get frank depression from some of these ailments. So um, I've mentioned there that the average life expectancy for women has generally increased over the years. And uh, for Zimbabwe, I don't know if you know, our life expectancy for women has actually gone up to about 60.8. Uh, so which means that uh, women can live for a decade or two after the menopause, and sometimes they will have these health problems that may actually need attention. And when you look at the other parts of the world, in South Korea, Japan, women will live up to about 80, 90 years old. So it means they'll spend about half of their lives in the postmenopausal era where they'll experience most of these problems, and some of them may, may need um, intervention. So what are some of those causes um, that will cause tissues to age and to become loose or to become lax? Um, some women just have a genetic predisposition to getting um, tissue laxity. Uh, some of them will have it because of menopause, because of that hypoestrogenic state. Um, the tissues will become a bit um, relaxed because of the lack of collagen. So it's actually said that uh, most women will lose up to about 30% of their collagen in the first five years after their menopause. And the stuff that they can do before the menopause to try and prevent this rapid loss in collagen, which may cause um, tissues to age rapidly and cause um, that laxity. Um, some women will have low estrogen states from different uh, conditions when they're breastfeeding. Some of them will have premature ovarian failure and the like. Um, pregnancy itself in childbirth, you know, they will cause tissues to age, they will cause tissues to scar, they will cause tissues to become a bit lax. Um, and smoking as well as uh, significant weight fluctuations may also contribute to tissues aging. So gaining excessive weight, losing excessive weight, all will contribute to tissues aging and becoming a bit lax. So I put up there just a list of some of um, the common but unspoken problems in women. And some of these um, that this laser I'm going to talk about can actually um, solve or try to solve. Uh, so women sometimes will have um, symptomatic or symptomatic pelvic organ prolapse with age. They could complain of urinary dysfunction, stress, urinary incontinence, sexual dysfunction. They can have um, fecal or flatus incontinence. They can have chronic pelvic pain, vulval, vaginal itching and pain. They can have abnormal vaginal discharge. Um, sometimes they'll complain about um, just even um, cosmetic issues of just looking good because of the lack of estrogen, the skin will look a bit wrinkled. So they can complain about the skin. They can complain about sagging breasts. Uh, pregnancy can come with stria, uh, moles, scars, and all of that. And also women can have vulval diseases like lichen um, sclerosis. They can have genital warts um, and many others. So I put up that chart there just uh, to show you that uh, in one series that was reported, stress urinary incontinence in women was actually more prevalent than um, those common conditions, hypertension, depression, diabetes. So it can actually be 
a very important problem in our society that can affect women. And uh, for stress incontinence, like I said earlier on, my talk is not about life and death um, issues really. It will not really be a life and death matter, but a quality of life problem or a quality of life matter, which we should give um, due attention to. And because of these subtle problems in women, um, some subspecialties have actually started to emerge because of that. And these include uh, female pelvic medicine, reconstructive surgery, uh, and lastly, the cosmetic and aesthetic gynecology. And I'm hoping that um, in the next couple of years, hopefully somebody will get interest and um, develop, especially the, the third one, cosmetic and aesthetic gynecology, where our laser therapy will nicely fit in. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me really to, to introduce to you um, this um, cutting edge technology that we call the FemiLift. So the FemiLift was actually initially approved by the FDA in 2014. And this is a pixel carbon dioxide laser machine, uh, which is a multimodality system that offers advanced computerized um, precision or precise technology for both fractional and non-fractional surgical procedures um, it will cause um, skin resurfacing, uh, causing a tightening of the vaginal tissue or even any surrounding tissue without causing aggressive tissue ablation. It offers treatment for various gynecological conditions as well. So that's what the machine looks like. Um, so how does it work? It actually works in, a, in an interesting fashion where it uses uh, uh, pixels. So it uses fractional technology basically. So it delivers the laser energy through a special lens that we call the, the diffractive um, optic lens that divides that energy into pixels. So basically, if you're going to be treating with the family lift probe, which is what we use here, it, uh, it will treat um, a surface area of about one square centimeter. And this one square centimeter will have pixels, 81 of them. These are microscopic pixels that are delivered in a nine by nine pattern. So it looks like dots when I'll show you a picture later on. So it means those dots are where the energy penetrates and causes the thermal damage, but the rest of the skin or the rest of the mucosa around is actually preserved. So there's intact tissue that is in between those pixels or those dots. And this uh, mechanism promotes faster healing. So the pixels actually induce a thermal effect in the lamina propria that stimulates the collagen um, fibers to synthesize collagen. So there's also new vessel blood formation as part of uh, the tissue remodeling process. So again, this is just to explain how the family lift works, uh, working in that pixel manner. So those, um, these ablated mucosa and microscopic columns of the thermal damage that penetrate deep into the submucosa. So this energy or this heat energy goes deep into the submucosa and stimulates the cells there to regenerate. So this strongly stimulates the growth of new collagen and uh, with time the collagen remodels and this allows the tissues to reform causing a lot of structural support depending on the organ that you're treating of course. But here we're going to focus mainly on the genital tract. So this is just a picture or a diagram just to illustrate how the energy gets um, to the tissues. So the laser beam comes and then it, it is splitted by pixel splitter into many pixel beams. And then these ones are then focused by our lens um, so that they can then go to the tissue and form those um, pixels in that nine by nine pattern. So that's what it looks like. And um, because of that pixel pattern, remember I said there's going to be faster healing and the vaginal wall it will be reju rejuvenated as a result. So effectively, the mechanism is that initially you've got your thermal damage. That's what uh, initiates the whole process um, in that microscopic manner. And then this initially causes the superficial cells or the mucosa to shrink, so this shrinkage. So if you're treating the vagina, for example, um, there's initial shrinkage already of that organ. And then uh, remember, we are causing the heat to go deep into the submucosa. So there's a deep aseptic wound that we create or damage or injury. And then this wound is what will stimulate the body to respond. And then is eventually we have collagen remodeling. So to put it in, in phases, basically what happens is that in the first two to three days after your treatment, like any tissue where you induce a form of injury, there's that immediate inflammatory response. So you've got tissue edema. There's going to be edema in those tissues. Um, there's going to be release of chemical mediators. 
which are going to draw now into the second phase, the fibroblasts and all of that, those cells are recruited. Um, initially, the collagen also shrinks. And then after the first three days into the following four weeks or say a month, um, there's uh, recruitment of those cells that will produce the collagen, that will produce the elastin. Uh, so these are fibroblasts that are recruited. So eventually you've got new dermal uh, molecular matrix that is formed, which will provide the, the basic structure of your organ or the basic support that your organ needs. Uh, you've got new collagen fibers that are going to form as well. And then with time, after months, several months after your treatment, the collagen fibers that have been laid will begin to mature. So they'll mature. Uh, the new elastin fibers that are there will also uh, contribute to the tissue's elasticity. So the tissue can then recoil. It can stretch and recoil better because of the collagen and the elastin. Um, because of that um, initial stimulus, there's new blood vessel formation. And with new blood vessel formation is improved, if it's in the vagina, there's improved um, lubrication. There's improved immune response, the local immune response. There's improved sensation to the tissue. There's improved um, even pH. So the pH is restored because remember, the epithelium sometimes lacks um, enough of the glycogen or the lactobacilli when the flora is disturbed. So once the pH is restored, um, the other problems that women get in terms of um, vaginal infections, recurrent yeast infections, all fall away because the pH is restored. So this is a picture of what the vaginal mucosa would look like. Um, soon after treatment. So if you were to take a corposcopic uh, picture of the vaginal mucosa, this is what it would look like. So you can see those black dots representing the pixels that I was talking about just now. So it will look dotted like that. And as you can see, most of the mucosa is actually preserved. Most of the, the, um, the, the lining of the vagina is actually not damaged, except on those spots. So that's where the regeneration will come from. So this is just a summary of what I've been explaining um, in terms of how uh, the laser works uh, from the first phase right through to the third phase where there's remodeling um, of the collagen fibers causing um, great support and uh, new blood vessel formation. So if we were to take um, the tissues and look at them histologically, this is what it would look like. So in the first picture there, we, we see um, the normal tissue, what it's supposed to look like. So usually this would be a premenopausal young woman who's got the epidermis, which looks nice and thick, and the dermis, which is rich in collagen fibers and elastin fibers. So with age and obesity, we move to the second picture there, where you start to notice that the, the epidermis or the, the, epi, the outer lining becomes a bit thin. And when you look at the dermis, um, the collagen fibers are replaced by abnormal tissue. So it means that tissue loses the skin luster, the skin becomes, starts to wrinkle and it loses the structure. Um, it loses elasticity, it loses the ability to stretch and recoil. And this is what happens. And then in the end, you've got tissue laxity. And um, the third picture there shows what happens to the tissue when you introduce carbon dioxide laser. So the laser removes the abnormal tissue by replacing it, as we explained, with the new collagen with a new elastin. So the tissue becomes um, structurally more sound, it becomes more firm and it can, it can stretch and recoil, but it becomes more elastic. <clears throat> this is again another example um, where you've got a woman who's actually postmenopausal. So that first picture shows um, atrophic vaginal mucosa in a woman with genital atrophy. So you find that the epithelium there is very thin and uh, with mild parakeratosis. But post-laser treatment, you can see how the, the, the epithelium thickens and the cells become rich again in glycogen. So which means the pH is restored. And if she had dryness, the lubrication is better. If she had recurrent infections, all of that falls on the wayside. And also remember that post-laser treatment as well, we've got new blood vessel formation. So you can see there in the lamina propria, uh, neovascularization happening. So the advantage to the family lift is that it's got different um, applicators and each of the applicators um, perform different functions for different indications. So interestingly, it's got this applicator that can actually cut and coagulate using the same probe. So this is what they call a focus applicator. So this can actually cut and coagulate and this one would use if you're treating, for example, um, genital warts. So you'd first put in your local and when you treat the genital warts, when you put that probe close to the to the surface that is being treated, 
it actually gets into a cutting mode. So you can actually see that it's cutting through. But when you're cutting, sometimes then you, you can cut through vessels and you've got bleeders. So for you to coagulate, you can actually just um, defocus or just um, lift the probe slightly uh, away from the skin. And once you move or defocus that beam away from the skin, it changes from a cutting mode to a coagulating mode. So you can actually do both using the same probe. So you cut your spots, if there's a bleeder, you move away and you can actually coagulate at the, using the same probe. Um, it's also got another applicator, which um, they call the defocused uh, non-ablative laser. So this, you can actually use it um, to just gently heat up the tissue. So for example, if you've got wrinkles and you want to do like the face or the skin over the genital area, the vulva, if um, the women want, for example, tightening, you can use um, this, uh, this uh, probe or this applicator where you gently heat um, the demo tissue or the skin. So when you heat it up, you've got your assistant um, measuring the temperature of the skin. So they usually say heat up the skin until you get to about a temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius. Then once you reach that, um, that, that temperature, continue to treat for another five minutes and then you stop. So once you, you, you treat uh, or you heat up those tissues, it's enough to actually also stimulate collagen synthesis. So you'll find that with time, you've actually resurfaced or tightened the skin because you've got collagen um, synthesis in the background. So like I've mentioned, it's got, it's, it actually comes with eight applicators, but for gynecology, we mostly find that we use um, the, first, the first three. So we've got the family lift, which I'll discuss a bit more just now. Uh, which is the probe that we use when you're treating women that have got vaginal laxity, that have got uh, stress urinary incontinence, uh, that have got recurrent uh, vaginal infections. So basically when you're treating the vagina, for whatever indication, we'll use the Femi Lift. The Femi Slim is the, the same probe. It looks like this. It's um, just a probe that you put over, over the actual applicator from the machine that you connect to the machine. So it's just got a smaller diameter, as the name says, Femi Slim. In this one, you'll use in women that have got severe genital atrophy, you cannot use the standard probe. So you can use um, the Femi Slim again in women that have got um, problems like vaginismus, where they've got a very um, tight uh, pelvic floor. So you can use the Femi Slim in those, in those women. And then we've got the Femi Smart. I'll show you some of the pictures as we go. So these ones would use mostly in gynecology. The other ones you can use for other cosmetic, um, other aesthetic indications, the True Spot. The focus, which comes in two sizes, 50 millimeter and 100 millimeter. The light scan that we can use for bleaching. Other women will come for other cosmetic indications. And the Femi tight that you can use also to tighten the skin. So you can use this on the, on the face for, for wrinkles. You can use this on the vulva skin to, to tighten the skin. So this is just a picture to show or to demonstrate those applicators. So you can see the standard one, which is the first one, the Femi lift probe. That's what we'll use um, commonly. Um, for, 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 gyne for most gynecological indications. And then the Femi Slim being smaller, and then the Femi Smart. The Femi Smart is basically the same as the Femi Lift Probe, except that it's just a robotic um, form of it. So basically you put your settings into your machine, your energy, select your energy levels, and then use the Femi Lift Smart um, as a robot. So when you just click go, then it starts to treat. It will treat uh, whatever area you want treated as you just hold the probe. And then the others are Femi Tight, Light Scan, and Femi Cam. So that's the, the robotic one, which is the... And then that's the Femi Cam. So the machine comes with a, with a camera. So some women want to see what it looks like inside the vagina before you treat and after. So they, 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 they come with, um, with a specific speculum okay, that you can use to connect your camera. So you can see what the vagina looks like before and the woman can actually see as well what it looks like after treatment. So these are just basically, some of them I've already alluded to, the indications that we have for family treatment. Um, as you heard, Dr. Pasco is already treating women uh, with pre-malignant conditions with what's at a clinic. Here we're treating mostly women with recurrent vaginal infections, vaginal dryness. Um, for post-delivery rehabilitation, women sometimes will complain of pain, residual pain post-delivery. Uh, Sometimes they've had uh, scarring due to perineal tears. They've had uh, vacuum deliveries, forceps deliveries, and they've got lots of scar tissue. So with painful coitus, this uh, treatment can also be used. Some women have surgical scars that uh, look ugly. The um, light scan can actually help 
tend the scars a bit lighter to look like the skin. Women with mild to moderate stress and incontinence, uh, women with vaginal laxity syndrome, women with vaginismus, all of these can also benefit from family lift. Also, there are a specific group of women that have undergone um, radiation, for example, to the pelvic area, and they have a vaginal atrophy post-radiation. So for as long as there's no evidence of cancer, they can also get laser treatment for vaginal atrophy. And women have valvodynia, dyspareunia, vestibulitis, lichen sclerosis. Some of these um, may benefit from laser therapy combined with other treatments. For example, you can use it together with what we call uh, platelet-rich plasma injections to optimize the outcomes. Um, Lightly time for questions for you. Okay. Um, can can I just um do one more minute? Would like to leave time for questions. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, should I stop? We can do one more minute and then we'll. Okay. All right. So the, we'll just ask okay. one or two questions. That's fine. Sorry about uh, the time. So contraindications, some of the women that are having active infection in the genital tract, for example, active uh, herpes, abnormal vaginal discharge, gynae cancer, abnormal pap smears, undiagnosed bleeding, even during menses, you cannot treat women that are pregnant, a woman with uncontrolled illnesses, for example, even diabetes, HIV, if it's not well controlled, then they're not um, ready for, for laser. And pre-treatment, we just usually go through a health um, uh, history questionnaire, a detailed genital urinary system questionnaire. We examine them, do a pelvic exam, sometimes a scan, and then they sign a consent, then we treat. Uh, so that's basically what it looks like when we're treating. I think you saw the treatment. So post-treatment, we avoid sex for three to five days. We avoid dodging and um, no insertion of tampons for the next three days. So I wanted to share a little bit about um, um, what we have just done so far. So, so far we've treated, we've done 66 treatments since February, 2020, and all of them have been really for family lift ranging from 29 years to 62. The 29 year old had a recurrent uh, vulval vaginal infection and the 62 year old is at genital atrophy. And some of the indications were for vaginal laxity, for dryness, for mild stress and incontinence, for recurrent infections, for genital atrophy and for vulvodynia. And we've been measuring our vaginal pHs and um, it was actually interesting to note that there was actually a reduction in the pH even after the first treatment. And we've had really significant and encouraging reviews from the patients with marked improvements in their symptoms reported after even the first treatment. So usually we treat um, in three cycles. So people usually require three sessions that are six weeks apart. And each treatment is usually about five to 10 minutes. We usually call it a lunchtime procedure because it doesn't take time. And um, yeah, it's generally safe, very easy and effective. Results are immediate and it's hygienic because the probes that we use are single use and we, we discard. And so, yeah, basically that's about family lift. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marere. Uh, it was difficult to stop you. The topic is so, uh, it's a very interesting topic of interest to men and women alike. And I will quickly just go through some of the questions that came up as you were uh, talking. And the first one is in, uh, in an atrophic vagina, how does the family lift compare to conjugate estrogen cream and cost effectiveness? Which one is better? All right, um, thank you for that question. And it's a relevant question, um, but unfortunately I've not come across the evidence to compare the two side by side. So you find that some of the women that have got, for example, vaginal atrophy, they may also have other symptoms like um, mild stress urinary incontinence. So what the laser does is it will regenerate the mucosa and also bulk up the area around the urethra and also control that. So in that regard, then it will help, but sometimes just Trying the topical estrogen therapy, if it works, it will definitely be cheaper because the laser therapy is quite expensive. But what I know is that the laser treatment has got longer lasting effects. So long as you do your two to three treatments and complete it, then the, the effects are usually there for several years after. Okay, and as a follow up to that, can this treatment be started prophylactically? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> the answer is no. You cannot treat this one prophylactically because um, it's just basically um, treating the deficiencies. So it's stimulating your body to regenerate what has become deficient. The collagen, the support has been lost. So it's actually there to regenerate the support that the tissue requires. Okay, and any role in patients with recurrent uh, bacterial vaginosis? I think you addressed this somewhat. Um, the role in recurrent bacterial vaginosis. You mm -hmm. said it does bring a balance to the pH. 
Yes. Yeah, there is definitely a role. We've actually had one or two patients that we have treated that had recurrent bacterial vaginosis, and sometimes they no longer know whether it's BV or yeast infection, but generally it will restore the pH. And once the pH is restored, that balance in the flora is restored. So the patients will benefit from, from laser therapy who have bacter recurrent bacterial vaginosis and recurrent yeast infection. And my last question will be on uh, complications, maybe those that you haven't mentioned. What are the complications of this procedure, Doc? Okay, yeah, it was on one of my slides. So <laughs> the complications, I knew it was coming, are uh, really very mild to none. So most of the time we cancel patients when they get the treatment that in the first uh, couple of days, they may have a, a pinkish discharge, sometimes even a bloody discharge, but usually there's nothing that they will feel. There's no pain, there's no downtime. So there's no, there's no untoward side effect, usually that. And for all the women that we've treated, the most they've had is that slight discharge in the first two to three days post-treatment, otherwise nothing else. And even in the reviews that have followed up the women over the years, they've not actually found any any untoward side effects or even long term so far from what they've they've published. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, very interesting discussion, and I know we'll have people uh, in your inbox, any direct messaging you, or even on the platform for any more questions so that we can address things uh, they may think about. Uh, we are just a few minutes behind time, Dr. Marere. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you I would like to move on to our next uh, session, uh, which is our next presenter. Um, this is... Um, our next presenter will be Dr. Mohammed, and um, his topic will be infertility and uh, polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome. Uh, Dr. Mohammed is a senior fertility specialist. He's practicing in Stanton. And over the years, he has provided fertility services for patients who have been referred to him by colleagues from Zimbabwe. And he has continued providing professional support to fertility specialists um, in Zimbabwe as this field has gained uh, or has become more established locally. So over to you, Dr. Mohammed. I can see Dr. Mohammed. Um, if you can start to share your screen.
Wat ook bij Unmute. Dr. Mohamed, we can see your screen. You can go ahead. Hi, Gulam. It's uh, Bismarck here. You can uh, just uh, click on the slideshow icon there, and then you have slideshow. The slideshow icon right at the top left corner, Gulam. Yes. Love if you move your, your, your mouse right at the top, um, where there's the home screen button, uh, move it uh, to the right. There's uh, some always written slideshow, and then you can just uh, click there, right. Good. And then uh, from current, uh, it's from beginning. If you scroll down, it says from beginning. Yes, right there. Right. You can go ahead. Uh, is he is he on is he on mute mute? No, no, we have unmuted him. So you can go ahead. You are unmuted, and we can see your screen. Hi, I think he's still struggling to speak, even though he is unmuted. Yeah, I think there's something wrong with his mic or something. Uh, Uh, did you log in? Uh, click the button and say log in with your computer mic. I'm wondering if he can hear us at all. Um, no, he can. So. We can't hear you, uh, but we can see your we can see your slides. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay, uh, but we, we, we can't hear you. So just check if your, if your machine. Please bear with us. Uh, Dr. Manteweke will call Dr. Mohammed, and hopefully we'll be up and running soon.
Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, afternoon, Dr. Ziggy. So, so Dr. Ateka. I having a little bit of a challenge. He can clearly hear us, but okay. when he's speaking, we can't hear him. So I've asked him to leave the meeting and rejoin by completing, okay. so that he can click that uh, option for computer audio. So it's requested that uh, if you may kindly ask um, the next presenter to go ahead okay. while he sorts out his issues and then he can present. Great, it. thank you, Dr. Matewake. Okay. So I will ask uh, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Mplanga. I'm just looking to see if he's there, but uh, Dr. Mplanga is going to be sharing with us uh, on uh, the experience with cervical cyclage in multiple pregnancies, in art uh, pregnancies. And um, we all know Dr. Mplanga, he's a specialist gynecologist, he's a uh, founder of the IVF uh, Center in Zimbabwe, very passionate about uh, fertility medicine. And I would like to invite you, Dr. Mslanga, to please go ahead with your presentation. So I, I think make me uh let me let me see. Uh okay. All right. Can you hear me? We. Oui. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Mplanga, we can hear you. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting on uh, my experience with cervical cyclage in multiple pregnancies uh, conceived through art. So my outline of my presentation, we're going to start off with, uh, with some, case, some cases that we, we dealt with, and then we'll go into discussion. So I'll present our first case, TS, a 37-year-old, uh, she was para three when I saw her with secondary subfertility for two years. The subfertility was as a result of polycystic ovarian syndrome. A UI was done and this resulted in twin pregnancy. And we did insert a cervical, uh, cervical cyclage was not inserted. And uh, this patient had an unremarkable uh, pregnancy that we delivered uh, at 38 weeks. Uh, the babies were essentially healthy. Our second patient was a 32-year-old para O, husband had a vasectomy in the first marriage, then the wife passed on, and then he remarried uh, the younger sister. So she, he then wanted to have another child. So we did TESA plus IVF. And uh, uh, We, we, we then did TESA plus IVF, and uh, it is important for us to know that this woman then, uh, she was young, she, she hyperstimulated. So we, we did a freeze all cycle, and uh, we froze 10 blastoses. The first frozen embryo uh, transfer that we then did after uh, failed, and then we, we did a second one, which resulted in twin pregnancy. No cyclage was inserted, and uh, the pregnancy was unremarkable and uh, her delivery was at 30, 37 weeks. So it, it is important for you to realize that uh, the first nine cases that we did, we didn't insert any cyclage. Uh, up until certain things happened and then we changed our, our thinking to, to, to insert uh, cyclage. So now we, we look at patient uh, ZM, 31 years old, para all with a seven-year history of self-fertility, secondary to male factor, 
and tubal disease. IVF ICSI resulted in tri triplets, no circlet was inserted, and again, uh, this patient now uh, had preterm labor uh, at 20, 21 weeks and lost the pregnancy at 22 weeks. The other patient was a 40 year old uh, woman with five years history of self fertility, which was uh, from a low sperm count and abnormal morphology. A UI was done, uh, and this resulted in twin pregnancy. She started bleeding at 16 weeks, and we, we did a scan on her, and uh, the pregnancy was noted to be viable. Uh, and also, as the viable length was four centimeters, all closed. So we essentially managed it with bed rest, and uh, she then got into preterm labor and lost the, baby, uh, the pregnancy at uh, 20 weeks. RIM, a 32-year-old, uh, she had a myomectomy in 2008. In 2013, she had a topic pregnancy and uh, presented to me with a five-year history of self-fertility. Uh, IVF was done uh, for tubal disease. She conceived twins, no cyclage was inserted. She had preterm labor at 20 weeks and rescue cyclage was inserted at 20 weeks. And uh, she managed to prolong the pregnancy for two weeks. She started draining at 22 weeks. And uh, then we, she got into preterm labor. We removed the cyclage and she lost her pregnancy. Um, CZ, a 32 year old para O, two year history of self fertility, uh, secondary to male factor had IVF done. She conceived twins. Um, and this patient, it was interesting that she got a bleeding before the day 10 uh, pregnancy test. So we then did a serial beta HCG, which uh, was more than 200% uh, rise. And we, we, we then did, a, we didn't insert a, a cervical cyclage in this patient. In terms of our management, uh, we just followed her up, but again, at 12 weeks, she started uh, bleeding and we put her on uh, the normal progestogen injection and bed rest. Preterm labor was again, uh, was at 20 weeks. At 12 weeks when we put her on progestogen injection, the bleeding stopped. So she continued with her pregnancy and at 20 weeks, she had preterm labor and um, we lost the pregnancy. TM, a 30 year old uh, uh, patient, presented to us with a two year history of secondary self fertility uh, as a result of blocked fallopian tube. Uh, she, she had um, IVF, IVF uh, done, which was successful. And then at eight weeks, uh, she started bleeding. We put her on neutrogestin and bed rest. At 11 weeks, she was uh, uh, treated for bacterial, uh, asymptomatic bacterial uh, bacteriuria. And then at 21 weeks, she, she had preterm labor. A rescue cyclage was attempted, but the cervix was fully dilated. So she was essentially managed uh, conservatively uh, up until she then started draining at 22 weeks and lost her pregnancy at uh, 23 weeks. TH is uh, also one of the patients that we looked after. 41 years old, one year of trying, uh, self fertility secondary to male factor, a year done, resulted in twin pregnancy, no cyclage inserted. She then developed a PIH at 37 weeks, uh, which resulted in us uh, delivering her at uh, 37 uh, weeks. For, for these twins, uh, this is at the point when we then said, look, we have uh, looked after nine pregnancies, uh, multiple pregnancies, and we have lost uh, five. And we then started a policy of cervical cyclage. But these twins, after we'd made that decision, they, they were lost to follow up because the woman then went back to, to UK. So this patient was a 37-year-old female patient presented to us with a 10-year history of self-fertility secondary to blocked fallopian tubes. IVF was done, she conceived twin, uh, twins, she, and then she went back to UK. No cyclage was inserted, 
Her pregnancy was essentially unremarkable, delivered at 38 uh, weeks, uh, very healthy babies. Now we then uh, started the policy of putting cervical cyclage to all the women who had uh, multiple pregnancy. Our cervical cyclage, we're putting them, uh, we're inserting them at uh, six weeks to 10 weeks. So CJ was a 37 year old uh, surrogate, consumed the twins through IVF. Uh, the biological mother had uh, recurrent implantation failure. So she looked for a surrogate. We did IVF and uh, that resulted in twin pregnancy. Four weeks post-transfer, she had an episode of PV bleeding. We managed it conservatively and uh, we did a scan, put it on our progestogen and a uh, bed rest. At six weeks, we, the bleeding had stopped. We did a scan to look for the fetal heart. And uh, when we saw it, we then inserted a cervical cyclage. And uh, the pregnancy from there onward became unremarkable and she delivered at 37 weeks. FC is a 30 year old uh, patient uh, who presented to us with a three year history of self fertility, secondary to no factor, had IVF exit done and conceived twins. Cervical cyclage was done after seeing the fetal heart at six weeks. And uh, she only had anemia and asymptomatic bacteria in the pregnancy. And this pregnancy was delivered at 38 weeks. So these twins that you, you are seeing again, they were conceived by a 42 year old uh, patient who had presented to us with a four year history of, uh, male, of, of sub-fertility, secondary to male factor. IVF uh, was done in the first cycle with their eggs. Unfortunately, it, it failed. So we, she then asked the sister to donate eggs for her and she conceived through IVF using donated eggs and uh, we did a scan at six weeks, so fetal heart, and the cyclage was put uh, at eight weeks. The pregnancy be became unremarkable, and we delivered a, a third, 37 uh, healthy babies, these ones. For these babies, they were conceived by a 40 year old uh, patient who had uh, 13, years, 13 years uh, history of secondary sub fertility. Uh, which was uh, from male factor, PCOS and some because of fibroid. She, she says in 2017, there was an attempt to remove this some because of fibroid hysteroscopically, but it was not successful. So when we saw her, we then offered the open myomectomy, a four centimeter some because of fibroid was enucleated. We stimulated uh, three months after the myomectomy and unfortunately she had a poor response. There was no eggs. So we then said, look, we are 40. We didn't get any eggs. Uh, I think you need donated eggs. So she got donated eggs. And uh, this, re this resulted in uh, a twin pregnancy. We did a, a, a transvaginal scan at six weeks. A fetal heart was seen. And from there, the pregnancy was unremarkable, uh, except for anemia and pregnancy-induced hypertension. We delivered it at uh, 37 weeks. All right. So for, for, for these twins, uh, uh, they were conceived by um, a 30 year old who had two ectopic pregnancy and uh, uh, the semen was also noted to be abnormal. I remember the semen had a low sperm count and uh, low motility. We then offered uh, this couple IVF ICSI, which then resulted in a twin pregnancy. We immediately put a cyclage at eight weeks and uh, this pregnancy, unlike the other pregnancies that we had put a cyclage, she had uh, Preterm labor at 31 weeks. We gave her tocolytics and dexamethasone course. Uh, and uh, at 32 weeks, unfortunately, she started draining and the labor pains were quite severe. We removed the cyclage and we delivered the patient. And she, the babies were admitted in neonatal unit for, for a month. But essentially, these babies were healthy. They didn't have any abnormalities. 
uh, on time of discharge from the neonatal unit. For this couple, uh, she is a, this patient was a foot four, these babies were conceived by a foot five years old. Uh, we, we had a two year history of some fertility, secondary to no factor. IVF exit was done. We Tom have Shana, a can I give you five more minutes? Five more minutes. Yes. So can I just move to my, let me just move a little bit faster. So mm -hmm. uh, let me move to, to, to discussion because most of my, my cases are quite uh, straightforward. So in terms of uh, the, the, the cases that I have presented, uh, our unit has witnessed one, 103 babies from 27 to 2020. And uh, 2019 only, we initiated 98 fresh IVF cycles and that resulted in 34 positive pregnancy tests plus a fetal heart. 24 pregnancies were carried all the way uh, to delivery of 14 singletons and 10 sets of uh, twins. We managed also we managed 18 frozen embryo transfer in 2019 and got 13 positive. And uh, 11 pregnancies were carried uh, to, to delivery. And this were divided into nine singletons and two sets of twins. We had a total of 47 babies. But for 2017 to 2020, we had 18 cases of multiple pregnancy conceived through IUI and IVF. Of these nine, three IUI, six IVF were managed conservatively without cervical cyclage. Five had preterm labor at 55, uh, which, which is about 55%, all happening before 24 weeks, which resulted in them losing their babies. And nine uh, uh, had early cervical cyclage and uh, this resulted in three of these nine having preterm labor at uh, 32 at 32 weeks and the other one at 35 weeks. And all the babies in this set of nine patients who had cervical cyclage are alive and well. The intervention that we're offering was a simple McDonald suture at six to eight weeks, which is uh, a permanent uh, mesilin uh, tip, uh, which was... Uh, a suture which we did uh, a pastry around the cervix uh, at the junction of the vagina and, uh, and, and, the, and the cervix. We, unlike other cervical cyclage that are normally put at 12 weeks, our cervical cyclage we're putting at, um, at six weeks. So it is important for us to realize that prematurity in multiple pregnancies is common and is a major health problem. The incident is actually higher with the approximation of 60% being born before 37 weeks. The relative risk that the twins will be delivered before 37 weeks is 5.5 compared with singleton. Because of prematurity, perinatal mortality is five to 10 times higher in singleton. Preterm birth increases risk of neonates to respiratory distress syndrome, patent ductus arteriosus, cerebral palsy, and intracranial hemorrhage, as well as blindness. For, for our management of patients, we started to look at how do we predict, predict a preterm uh, birth. It is known that cervical length has a bearing, as well as uh, things like funneling and uh, fetal fibronecting test. It is also important for us, was, uh, for us to, to acknowledge that who uh, acknowledge that the, there is an increased risk in preterm birth associated with self-fertility and also art treatment. Hence, when we then put cyclage, we decided not to predict who is going to get uh, preterm, but we just put to everyone. Uh, you also see in an article in Hindawi, uh, which showed that IVF and ICSI are an, are an independent risk factor for spontaneous preterm labor. So in summary, there the are articles most people will try to avoid um, having preterm labor by just putting back one. But in our setting, it's almost impossible because we then we practice double embryo transfer for this reason. Our patients desire, they desire to have twins and also it increases pregnancy rate. And our patients can only afford one uh, IVF cycle in most of the times. So our first uh, chance or our first cycle should be successful. So what we have offered, there are evidence to it, which shows uh, 
that there is benefit. And I'm just going to go through the slides. We're showing the evidence that this case efficacy of ultrasounds indicated cyclage twin pregnancies, uh, which was in the American Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology. The conclusion also showed us that there is benefit in putting cyclage. There is also this article against the viral cyclage for preterm birth prevention in twin gestation with short cervix, which was a retrospective study and called start, not the best evidence, but it also showed benefit. There's also this uh, again article prophylactic cyclage in ICSI twins to or do's or not to do, which also showed benefit. And lastly, our most people tried to avoid uh, cervical cyclage in twins because of this article that was uh, read, that of this research in 1982, which showed negative effect of the cervical cyclage on, uh, on twins. But this has been proven uh, wrong. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mslang, and thank you for allowing us to catch up um, with our time because of the technical glitches that we had. I will quickly go through questions that are on the chat, and uh, one of them you have answered, you answered as soon as it was put up, what kind of circlage was inserted. I'm sure you said you put a McDonald's uh, suture. And the next question was, do you do preterm birth surveillance for the cases you apply the, you apply the circlage on? Do you do cervical length assessments? Yes, our, our, our patients that we look after, they, they actually have a program for ultrasound scan. So there is uh, a doctor who does scan them uh, and uh, measure the cervical length, measure the fetal weight and the, their growth. So that we actually do. Thank you. I hope Dr. Virenga, you have been answered. And from Dr. Guanzura, she says, what's the rationale for inserting the cyclage? Um, at six to 10 weeks, as opposed to the routine, uh, which is usually put later than that? So, so for our patients, uh, the rationale is one, putting the cyclage at six weeks to eight to, to 10 weeks. It's one, the cyclage is easier to insert. Number two, it gives time for the cyclage to heal. And number three, if you look at all the cases where cervical cyclage was attempted and the, the evidence is not showing any benefit, it was inserted around 12 to, to 16 weeks. Unfortunately, our data is not enough for us to, to say there's much benefit, but other uh, countries like India, they are also putting early cyclage and with good benefit as compared to putting it at uh, 12 to 14 weeks. Um, thank you very much. And uh, as a follow-up from Dr. Verenga, he has asked if you recommend cyclage play, uh, placement for those with a spontaneous uh, twin pregnancy. And also, do you put the patients routinely on uh, progesterone? And I think that will be my last question to allow us to catch up. All right. So for, for, as, you, as you have seen, we have not included patients who have conceived spontaneously. They tend to be a different population. One of the most important thing is IVF, subfertility, and IUI, all the treatments for subfertility, they're actually a risk factor for preterm labor. So for, for us, we're just managing our patients who had IVF, uh, IUI, not those who, who had uh, spontaneous labor. But I think with evidence that we are getting, there might also be benefit to those who had uh, uh, spontaneous uh, uh, twin pregnancies. And we, we, our patients, because they've had uh, to go through IVF, most of them, they are on luteal phase support, which is a progestogen. So yes, we do put all of our patients on progestogen, uh, uh, pessaries, and sometimes injectables. Um, thank you, Doctor, um, for your stimulating um, topic uh, on multiple pregnancy and the benefits uh, that we now recognize uh, from placing a cyclage as opposed to the old teaching that a cyclage uh, is not helpful. Dr. Guja, uh, since you're the only one who had a question, I'll allow you to ask this question before we move on to Dr. Muhammad. Hey, uh, thanks, Tino, for, for the nice talk and um, congratulations for setting up uh, your uh, world-class uh, fertility clinic. I, my question is, has any randomized controlled trials explored this question? 
comparing the six to eight weeks versus the, the 12 weeks, because certainly the evidence could be much stronger if there's a randomized control trial that's, uh, that supports that theory. <laughs> Unfortunately, Dr. Gusha, when I was looking, most of the evidence that is on the ground is uh, of uh, 12 weeks to 16 weeks or 12 weeks to 14 weeks. There is not much evidence to early cyclage, but I can, I, I can tell you there is some studies that are currently ongoing, uh, but the results are not yet uh, on the public domain. Okay, thank you. Um, I will call upon Dr. Muhammad uh, to kindly go ahead uh, with his uh, presentation. I had introduced him earlier, so to try and catch up, I will just welcome Dr. Muhammad from Hello. South Africa. Hello. 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 Can you can you hear me now? I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, sorry, sorry for the glitches that happened, but it seems to me that I think we got it under control now. And uh, firstly, thank you all for inviting me to this uh, conference of yours, to this virtual conference. I'm glad to see old friends here, and I hope you're all well. So I'm going to be talking on uh, polycystic uh, syndrome and infertility mainly. And for the first slide, you know, I just want to, what is PCOS? Now PCOS actually means many cysts in the ovary. Poly means many. But um, actually the, it's a misnomer because it should actually mean polyfollicular ovaries. But when stay uh, Leventhal and uh, uh, Stein Leventhal actually made the, uh, made the diagnosis or the discovery in a lady at laparotomy, it has remained to be uh, polycystic uh, ovaries. And so we stuck with that definition for now. So actually it's a hormonal imbalance that interferes with the maturation of the follicle and the egg that it contains so that the egg cannot be released. There are many immature follicles that, uh, that are there that remain in the ovary and do not ovulate. So it is also complicated by metabolic syndrome and the metabolic syndrome predisposes one to obesity, to diabetes, insulin resistance and elevated blood cholesterol. So it's so while many, many women may have polycystic ovaries, it's a few women that have the syndrome. The actual incidence, I think, for polycystic ovaries would be about 20% of all women, but only 10% would actually have the, the, the syndrome. So the cause of polycystic ovaries is not very well un understood, but we know that genetic factors could definitely play a very important role because we know it's very much more common if one twin has it, especially if monozygotic, the other one would have it too. Or if sisters have it, sister siblings, then the other have a 50% chance of developing it too, too. There are some ethnic groups that are also at higher risk for this. And uh, environmental factors play an important real role in, uh, in this uh, syndrome because it's also associated with shared genetic influences like lifestyle factors, diet, exercise, et cetera, that are shared by significant family members. And it is related, as I mentioned earlier, to the metabolic syndrome. So the most common condition associated with polycystic ovary is chronic anovulation. It is a functional derangement and not a peripheral or a central defect. Polycystic ovaries develop within a chronic ovulatory state. The important thing I think to understand here is that there are two hormones that play a major role here. And one is LH and the other one is of course insulin where there's insulin resistance. What happens is that the 
hypothalamus does not secrete regularly as in normal women. In other words, it does not secrete in pulses of 90 minutes. It secretes erratically and very fast. As a result of that, the LH is increased quite significantly. And if LH is increased, androgens are increased. Also, the ratio LH FSH ratio is re reduced. As a result of a lot of androgens being produced, there's a lot of aromatization of the androgens to estrogen, which again puts a negative effect on the FSH, so you get low FSH. And this is the diagram that shows it. That's the hypothalamus at the top there. LH rises, stimulates the Tika cells to produce androgens. Aromatization occurs, but not, uh, not as efficiently as in normal women, as a result of which ovulation is interrupted. So the insulin resistance and compensatory hyperinsulinemia are common. Increased LH and insulin stimulation drives ovarian androgen production. This androgen and insulin inhibits the production of SHBG in the liver. As a result of that, there is free androgens which are circulating in the, in the blood. And this again interrupts uh, ovulation. It also contributes to obesity, which aggravates the pathophysiology of insulin resistance and PCOS. There are other factors that are or other morbid conditions that are associated with polycystic ovary. And uh, this is mainly due to ovarian adrenal production. Both LH and insulin increase androgen production and other compensatory factors are expended on an expanded ovarian stroma, which has increased sensitivity to insulin and LH and produces uh, androgens again. So it's a polygenic disorder and it involves the interaction of many genomic variants and environmental factors. The effects of PCOS on uh, pregnancy. Once uh, a woman is pregnant, she's at risk of uh, of increase of increased risk of miscarriage, and this is probably due to ovarian or, or follicle dysfunction. There's a greater risk of gestational diabetes, premature delivery, small for gestational age babies, eclampsia, and perinatal mortality is definitely increased. The diagnosis of this is really based on clinical signs and that is irregular menstrual cycles and signs of androgen excess. Obesity seems often to complete the picture. There is the diagnostic criteria, the Rotterdam criteria that, uh, that we all use, which means oligomenorrhea, which is less than nine cycles per, uh, per year, or amenorrhea, hyperandrogenism, whether chemical or clinical, an ultrasound picture of of uh, ovarian follicles sort of arranged in a necklace fashion. They call it the pearl necklace. The guy, the, 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 the gold standard is the transvaginal ultrasound. And this should be performed to take a closer look at ovaries. The ovaries with, uh, of women with polycystic syndrome are typically enlarged and covered in multiple small follicles, five to seven meters. They should have a minimum of 12 to make the diagnosis in one ovary. And not all women who have PCOS are, have, poly, have, this, have this syndrome. That's what uh, I said right in the beginning. So this is on the left is the normal looking ovary. The one on the right is a polycystic ovary, which has the small follicles all arranged in a sort of a necklace. And of course, the ovarian stroma are thickened. So you have a much more ovarian stroma. So what are the tests that one does? Aside from the clinical picture and the ultrasound, the blood tests for free testosterone should be done because commonly it is elevated, the testosterone. Other blood test results indicate a high LH, high endosteendione, high epiendosteendione sulfate, and the latter sometimes is elevated over 700 micrograms, and definitely at that level indicates adrenal dysfunction.
The anti-malarian hormone gives us a very good idea of uh, the diagnosis of PCOS, and it can also give us an idea on the responsiveness of the ovary to stimulation and the risk of developing uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is, of course, a technical problem. So the reasons for subfertility in the PCOS is basically anovulation and a compromised oocyte quality and fetal development due to obesity, metabolic and inflammatory and endocrine abnormalities. So the reduced competence of the ovary in a in an ovary with uh, with a polycystic ovary and ovarian hyperandrogenism, the hyperinsulin promote premature granulosa cell luteinization. And that's one of the reasons we get a decreased pregnancy rate in patients with polycystic ovaries. Paracrine, paracrine dysregulation of growth factors can occur as well. So the metabolic disturbances that occur in conjunction with polycystic ovaries as impaired insulin signaling, glucose metabolism have consequences in the Offset energy production. There's also altered expression of genes encoding for oxidative phosphorylation. And the fetal exposure to androgen, hyperandrogenemia disturbs epigenetic programming, making the fetus, if it's a female, also more likely to develop uh, uh, polycystic ovaries. So the management of this condition, especially in relation to uh, infertility, I'll just run through it quickly. The mainstay and the main, main, uh, the, the, the most important uh, lifestyle management is diet and exercise. Those two form the cornerstone of treatment in polycystic ovarian disease. And often if a patient just loses five kilos rapidly, she will kick into ovulating spontaneously. It is not going to be easy for her to lose weight. It is not going to, she needs to be counseled very, very carefully about this. But even small uh, episodes of weight loss will be very, very helpful. In terms of uh, me uh, medical treatment for ovulation induction, of late, the first line treatment has become lateral zone. It's a uh, uh, it's an uh, aromatized uh, enzyme inhibitor. It's got a short half-life. It, uh, it uh, doesn't have much of an effect on the, on the cervical mucus and the endometrium and doesn't have that many uh, side effects. Metformin apparently can also be an ovulation induction agent, although most people now believe that on its own, it's not qualified. It doesn't qualify is ovulation induction agent. And then of course they are gonadotrophins. The second line are gonadotrophins and laparoscopic uh, ovarian drilling. Most, uh, most IVF clinics and most uh, articles in the literature have gone away from laparoscopic uh, drilling, uh, especially in very selected cases. And the reason being is that you can get away these days with gonadotrophins, or you can get away medically in uh, inducing ovulation. So laparoscopic ovarian drilling has become less and less popular, but, and also it's been discovered that as a result of uh, laparoscopic ovarian drilling, ovarian tissue is damaged and that's not recoverable. So the anti-mullerian hormone goes down and that creates a poor ovarian this, uh, poor ovarian response in the ovary. Also, post uh, laparoscopic drilling, you have adhesions formation, and uh, those are sometimes quite uh, quite serious. So people do this, but they do it in selective cases. And the third line treatment is, of course, IVF and IVM. But uh, IVM, I mean, again because of recent advances in IVF of vitrification and antagonist protocol, uh, IVM has, uh, has lost favor. So if one is going to induce ovulation in a patient, it is important that you get the systems as close 
to normal as possible. So you normalize blood glucose, normalize weight as much as possible. Blood pressure should be normalized. Cessation of smoking and alcohol. Diet should be a low carbohydrate diet and a moderate exercise should be, should be uh, recommended. And of course, there should be support for mental, emotional and sexual health. So do we actually test for, uh, uh, for patency of the fallopian tubes before we start uh, ovulation induction? Well, if there's a history of STDs or other pelvic pathology of endometrium, then it would be uh, uh, advisable to do a laparoscopy and actually test for the tubal patency and at the same time rule out endometriosis because if endometriosis is present, the patient will do much better with IVF. I mean, I'm talking about stage three and four endometriosis. The, what has become first line treatment for ovulation induction is letrozole worldwide. Uh, and again, like I said, because it doesn't have much of an effect on, uh, on uh, endometrium and the cervical mucus. Also, it's an aromatase inhibitor and the half-life is not as long as clomiphene. Letrozole resistance is lower. The likelihood of live birth has increased from 40 to 60%. There's lesser chances of multiple pregnancy because of the way it acts. Uh, a mode of action of enzyme aromatase enzyme inhibitor and a short half-life. Clomiphene is being used less and less because one, it has a very short, long half-life uh, of nine days. Its method of uh, inducing ovulation is different. It's a receptor blocker. And because it's got a long half-life, it's uh, uh, there's a greater chance of a long, uh, uh, a long length of time over which FSH is produced and it predisposes to multiple pregnancies. The ovulation rate is 60 to 85%, but the pregnancy rate is lower. And I suspect it's lower because of its effect on the endometrium. So, is because of the anti-estrogen effect on endometrium on the cervical mucus, uh, decrease in uterine blood flow, impaired placental proteins, subclinical pregnancy loss, effects on tubal transport, and detrimental effect on the outside. Of course, with uh, obesity, the dose has to be- Dr. Dulam, I could ask you to speak for about five more minutes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I'll go through that. So. The other one that I wish to just quickly mention is gonadotrophins. Now, there are various protocols here, but the most efficient protocol is the low-dose step-up protocol. Sometimes it takes a long time, but in a PCOS patient, for ovulation induction, that is the best protocol. If you use that protocol, it is mandatory that you should have facilities for ultrasound monitoring and if need be, canceling the cycle or converting the cycle to uh, IVF. So those two things should be in place. Uh, and it's only used if the patient can't conceive on letrozole and uh, clomiphene. So the conventional dose is 150, but that's too high in a PCOS. What we normally do is we start them off with 37.5 for two weeks and then increase by 37.5 every week. And sometimes it takes a month to actually get a follicle, but the success rate is quite high. It's about a 45% success rate. The main thing to worry about here is uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. There are combination protocols, for example, thromophene or letrozole and uh, gonadotrophins can be used. And to reduce the LH surge, one can give clomiphene right up to the day of trigger or letrozole right up to the, it inhibits the LH surge. Uh, second line gonadotrophins, like I say, you should uh, have uh, your, your ultrasound and that in place. Now, when you're using gonadotrophins, luteal support is mandatory because there are supraphysiological levels of estrogen 
and they disrupt the, 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 the luteal phase. So progesterone support is essential. Uh, well, yeah, second line therapy resistance, ovarian drilling I spoke about, that's because of thermal destruction to th thicker cells, decreased androgens, increased uterine blood flow, and ovarian inflammation increases production of growth factors. Just a short video to show this. Uh, and there's controversies as to how many holes to drill. Most, most people now say you drill four, one hole for four seconds. Laparoscopic cost, expertise, complications, etc. Third line is, uh, of course, it's IVF. For IVF, one needs to do proper counseling. For PCO patients, especially those people that have an antimalarian of more than 10, I find IVF to be the most efficient treatment. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't go through, but the main problem, the iatrogenic problem is ovarian hyperstimulation. It's as a result of the estradiol and, and the culprit is HCG. If you don't, if you don't, uh, if you don't administer HCG, the patient will not hyperstimulate. She might overstimulate for a little bit, but not much more. It's a, it's a condition that is characterized by acute shifts in body fluids, and most cases are iatrogenic. So it's again the ex expansion of VEGF as the most important one, and the I HCG stimulate stimulation is the trigger. The antagonist protocol these days was uh, Lucrin. Uh, with uh -huh. trigger, okay, with Lucrin trigger and freezing all the outside is the safest. I think I'm going to stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad, and thank you for allowing us to catch up a bit with our time. And uh, we have questions for you from uh, uh, the group, and I'll ask Dr. Um, Cooper's question. The first he asked, uh, most women with PCOS are on metformin. Should this be continued in pregnancy? It's controversial. Some people say you can continue it, but most people advise that once the patient is pregnant, to stop it. So we all stop the metformin then. And the dose to use metformin is two grams. Please don't forget that. And please use it with myo-inositols as well. Thank you very much for that. And then from Dr. Guja, he says, in view of the availability of high resolution ultrasound, how valid is the Rotterdam criteria of the 12 follicles? They, 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 they still valid, they still valid, but you'll usually have more than 12 follicles. Okay. And uh, again from Dr. Cooper, how common is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in women with PCOS and what can we do to prevent it? Right, the, the, the worldwide incidence is about 1%, okay? Which has now gone down because we've changed the way of triggering. The way to prevent OHSS is always to identify those patients and lean PCO patients are the most at risk. People with high anti-mullerian hormones above five are most at risk. People who, uh, who, who uh, those, those two people to identify before you start stimulation. And if you're gonna stimulate for ovulation induction, use the low dose step up. If you're gonna do for IVF, trigger with uh, HCG and freeze all the embryos and do a delayed frozen transfer. But, um, I hope we have been answered uh, on the uh, questions that have been posed. Uh, anyone with questions, you may raise your hand and uh, we will allow you to ask uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad, thank you so much for that enlightening uh, reminder of the processes in PCOS and the treatment modalities available. Um, so through this session, we've seen Dr. Marere speaking to us about uh, improved quality of life with Femilift. And we've seen the benefits of uh, circlage in IVF, uh, multiple pregnancies. And uh, again, the very good talk from Dr. Muhammad on um, polycystic ovarian disease. We are 
thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, if I could um, quickly invite um, um, I think it's a slight change to our program, but uh, for now, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Kara, who is the clinical manager for uh, of Africa for Mindray, and she's an Algerian registered uh, sonographer in GI and OBG and vascular. Um, she has a certification from cardiology from the Department of uh, Pompidou in the University Hospital in France. So I'll give her two minutes uh, to talk to us before I allow the secretary to come on. Ms. Kara, uh, please come in. Whilst you're waiting from Ms. Kara, I think there's a comment from Dr. Moyo to say the, again, thank you to Dr. Muhammad for that very informative talk on polycystic ovarian disease. I don't see Ms. Kara coming on uh, and um, whilst I'm waiting, our next uh, uh, doc, I was going to invite the next person on, as per schedule is uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Magure, the Zeta Soji president. Maybe she can give us a report uh, to members whilst we wait for Ms. Kara to get ready. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ziki, for giving me this time. I have nothing much to report. First, I just want to congratulate everyone who has stayed the whole day on now inaugural future annual conference which I must say has been a very successful conference. And thank you all the presenters, especially our international guests who gave us very informative um, presentations. Um, and also thank you to the local ch uh, chair sessions. And above all, pump pump to the scientific committee, which is the only active committee which has been working this year from around July when we decided to start, it, to start our virtual CM activities. They've been on it and this has been the highlight of this year. Congratulations to you, to you and thank you very much for such a, a brilliant <clears throat> annual conference you have put together. I know it has been a very difficult year for all of us, which has kept us in our homes. Hopefully we have taken this time to take reflections, to re-energize, to, re to refocus, and to re-strategize because there's still life after COVID. And I also want to congratulate everyone for staying on board. Our health sector has been going through a very difficult patch. Uh, besides the COVID, there have been industrial actions, but uh, which have affected the provision of maternal and reproductive health services. But at least we have managed to continue to offer these services throughout the country and saved uh, many lives. Um, well done to you. As a society, this year we have not been able to do much of what we plan to do this year. But I want to thank uh, those who have been working, especially the scientific committee 
and our secretary Veronica always been on top of her game to make sure everything was uh, flowing, was planned and scheduled accordingly, and always been attending all scientific activities. Thank you very much, Veronica, um, for that. It is my hope that um, we'll get more presentations from other provinces. I think most presentations have been coming from Harare and Blawayo, but we know that as a society, we have members in all the provinces of this nation. So hopefully we'll be getting volunteers to make presentations, to share your experiences from wherever you are. We know there's a lot happening out there. We need to, to know. And um, I would also like to congratulate our only affiliate subspecialty at the moment, the Zimbabwe Society for Guinea Endoscope, which also managed to hold its virtual um, annual conference successfully. It was a high powered one with uh, international speakers as well. And it is my hope that most um, the other subspecial specialties will become active and offer broader source for CME activities um, uh, going forwards. So with these few words, I would like to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a prosperous 2021 ahead. Asante sana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Magure. Um, Ms. Kara, you should be ready. We are ready for you. You can go ahead. You have two minutes uh, for your presentation. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this chance to give this uh, short, very short uh, speech. Uh, I would like to thank um, the Obigaini uh, Society for giving, giving us this opportunity to be uh, to be present and to, to show the, um, our solution, our Mandra solution, and also give us uh, the, the opportunity to, to present all our Mandra uh, uh, with our local partner in Zimbabwe uh, for a woman healthcare. I was able to follow all the exchanges which prove the strong involvement of all the medical staff in the women healthcare. So you could see after the presentation of my colleague Goretti uh, that at Mandre we are working to face all the challenges of your daily work. So we can offer the total solution on that from prenatal to the post-recovery period with a high-end soft and a smart workflow. So in Mandre, we are all happy to be part of this strong exchange and the webinar and a very informative uh, presentation. And we hope that there will be many more like this one. So thanks again and hope to see you very soon for other webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, and for keeping our time. Now I think we have, if there's such a thing, we have actually managed to get ahead uh, of time and I will invite Dr. Matereke uh, to give us uh, the closing remarks for our webinar. Uh, Dr. Matereke, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ziki, for holding forth and um, seeing us through the third session of um, the scientific conference. Um, I think uh, the president has uh, managed to really thank everyone who has participated uh, in getting this conference going, as well as everyone who participated. I would like to put special thanks to our international speakers, special thanks to all the chairs who are chairing the sessions, special thanks to our local speakers, special thanks again to the scientific committee for putting up this program. I would like to thank again Mindray, KDB Holdings for coming in to assist and um, get this uh, you know, uh, program going today. I think without them, we may uh, have struggled a little and we really want to thank them as our partners for ensuring that uh, 
uh, the relationship remains healthy and uh, we continue working together in uh, uh, pushing uh, the cause in terms of our objective as a society, as well uh, as uh, making sure that we uh, give relevant content, world-class content uh, that is relevant uh, to this day and age when it comes to approach to uh, evidence-based uh, uh, medicine. And I would like to thank all the, leads, uh, the participants from across the globe from who are listening in and participating in our conference. And uh, for sure, uh, we are really planning something like this again next year. If um, COVID doesn't allow us to meet, we'd really love to make sure that uh, the next conference is uh, an eyeball to eyeball one. Uh, it would have been nice to rub shoulders with uh, uh, celebrities in obstetrics and gynecology that we're hosting today. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you uh, uh, to everyone who helped uh, make sure this day comes to force. Thank you so much. We declare the, I can safely declare this uh, session to be over. Thank you everyone and goodbye. Thank you, Madam Chair.